All right, thank you for coming this morning, and I'm going to do something a little different. I'm going to, I've got my watch, I've taken it off, I probably won't look at it, uh, because I have uh, more to say to you than uh, I have time to, uh, to say it. I promise you that it will not be longer than a football game. <laughs> Fair enough, uh, because we are in 40 days of prayer, and we're praying for a personal revival, for church revival and for national revival. And today we're going to talk about national revival. And as an American citizen, as a, as a father, as a grandfather, as, a, as your pastor, I think it's important that, that I raise a warning flag, that I sound an alarm, that I help you understand where I think we are. I may be preaching to the choir. You may understand exactly where we are. I want to answer three critical questions the next three weeks. Where are we? How did we get here? How do we turn back? You don't want to miss next Sunday because it's so important to understand how we got where we are. Because we'll never change and we'll never, unless we understand exactly what got us here. So be here next Sunday. But America, as I see it, is a train going down the railroad track at 90 miles an hour, and there is a cliff ahead of us. Now, here's the deal. No matter who gets president, the next president cannot turn this train around. This election may determine whether or not we go over the cliff or we're able to slow the train down to give us time so that we can begin the long, hard, difficult process of turning America around. In my opinion, this is the most critical election in our lifetime. We must vote. We must go from the prayer closet to the ballot box. And we must vote for the person that we think understands and believes our founding principles. We must vote for the person that we believe will most likely listen to God and his principles. Here's what concerns me. Half of evangelicals, now I don't want to just assume you know what an evangelical is. You, you are one. <laughs> That's one who believes the Bible is the word of God, and you have been born again by the Spirit of God. 49% of evangelicals do not vote. A hundred million Americans do not vote. Many evangelicals are not even registered to vote. In every election we've had, no president has won with more than 10 million more votes. Do you understand that if evangelicals, if just most of them voted, we could change the road this country's on? So we have to vote. These are scary, troubling times. These are not normal times. We do not have normal problems. The vice president may be laughing, but God isn't. America doesn't need tweaking. America needs to turn around. 
If I understand this book, and if I understand what God is saying to my heart, and if I understand what I see happening around me in America, America is absolutely going in the wrong direction. So where are we as a nation? We are becoming morally and spiritually bankrupt. And if China called in our debt and we stop printing money out of thin air, we'll become, spirit, we'll become economically bankrupt. So where are we economically? We're at a tipping point. We're at the edge of a fiscal cliff. We're facing a tsunami. You know about it personally. A dollar's worth about half its value. Groceries are up. Income is down. Insurance is up. Gas is up. You know, I was in a restaurant eating the other day, and I just happened to, I looked at the bill, and they charged me $2.29 just for the Coke. I remember when Coke was five cents. I remember when it went to six cents and they put a little box. That's back when America was honest and you just put the penny in the little box. You know, put the quarter in the machine and then you added the penny in the little metal box in the front of the Coke machine. But you see, economically, it's affecting all of us. And America's deficit is dangerously unsustainable. Deficit spending, spending more than you have. That won't work in your home. It won't work with your family. And here, here's the sad point. 40 cents of every dollar we spend is borrowed money. About half of it from China and about half we print. We can't, we can't get enough from China and we print our money. Now imagine just your own family. I mean, you would never dare tell somebody that you're borrowing 40%, 40 cents on every dollar you're spending. Because nobody can get by with that. And yet it's happening in this country. We spend a trillion dollars on welfare. And, and here's, again, we go back to, to principles. Our president, with an executive order, took the work part out of welf welfare so that you don't have to work to get, to get money. And you see, we don't help people that way. We hurt people that way. We, we lower their, their, their self-esteem. We, we take them down as a person. We make them dependent. Somehow that has to change. But on top of that, we can't afford it. How much do we owe? $16 trillion. $16 trillion. And that's just the tip of the iceberg because America has promised tens of trillions more money in Social Security and in, and in Medicare and Obamacare. And do you understand what's about to happen with the baby boomers, 80 million of them starting to retire? We can't afford that. And we'll go down financially on the route that, that we're going. Lee asked Will, my four-year-old grandson, how much he loved Doc Doc. And he said, 300,000 million. I was impressed. And then he asked, uh, Will, how much do you love me? He said, one. <laughs> she wasn't impressed with that. And she said, Will. And he said, two. <laughs> and she finally got him to 300. <laughs> but the amazing thing is that, that Will loves me a trillion plus. Because let's conceptualize what a trillion dollars is. That's a one with 12 zeros behind it. That means that if you took $1 bills and you stacked them up to make a trillion dollars, 
The height of that stack would be 67,866 miles. If you had a trillion dollars when Jesus was born and you spent a million dollars every day since then, you would still have almost a third of your money left to spend. Some of you women getting excited. <laughs> That's one trillion. We owe 16 trillion dollars. And it's going up a trillion or more a year right now. Now, you know that we have huge economical and political issues. We have huge problems. Entitlement reform, immigration reform, tax reform, and simplify the tax code, lower the deficit, lower the debt, balance the budget, create more jobs, have a stronger military. We need all of those things. But you know why those problems haven't already been solved? I'll give you 545 reasons. 435 of them are in the House of Representatives, 100 in the Senate, nine are in the Supreme Court, and one's in the presidential office. Those 545 people are responsible for every single problem we have. And I'm so disappointed in our Congress that, that most of them seem to be there only for perks and power and to stay in office. And now we are in this problem, these huge problems that are going to destroy this country and they're doing nothing about it. They're miserably failing the American people and they're attacking each other instead of attacking the problems that we have. Now, all of these problems, economical and spiritual political issues, If we fix all of those things, it will not fix our souls. And as important as these issues are, the greatest issues facing America are not economical and not political. They are moral and spiritual. When there is moral decay, there is always economic disaster. So the problem is where we are morally and spiritually. And another problem is that, that we are in a war with evil in the world. And evil seems to be winning right now. And, and if, we don't, if we don't do something about it, if we're not able to to rise up and be the church, if we're not able to, to go back to our, our principles, evil has the upper hand. And we're hated. The terrorists are not weakened and they're not calming down. In fact, they're spreading out. They're in more countries. They're in 11 countries, maybe some think even up to 30 countries. That threat is growing. We learned that from Benghazi. We learned that from this past week when, that, when a, a terrorist hit the detonator and his goal was to blow up the Federal Reserve Building and hundreds would have been killed. But it was a fake bomb. But the intention was the same. And the Middle East is a ticking time bomb that will explode. You've heard on television news, all the hate America stuff. The hate America demonstrations throughout the Middle East and the burning of the American flag and cursing America. Why is the nation that has given more money, more supplies, more help, killed more bad people, sacrificed more lives than any country in the world. Why are we hated? 
three reasons. Number one, our belief in Israel's God. Number two, our commitment to freedom. Number three, our protection of human rights. That's why we're hated. And which one of those do you want to give up? We can't give up any one of them. Our belief in Israel's God, you see, Yahweh, the God of Israel, is the true and living God. There is no other. Oh, it's a day of tolerance. And a day when, when the message is be respectful for other religions, and I agree with that, respect other religions. But then they take it a step further that all religions are equal. No, 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 no. Jesus said, I am the way. There is no other. And then Israel. The erosion of Americans' loyalty toward Israel is frightening. Israel is not one of our, just one of our allies in that region of the world. Israel is our greatest ally. And throwing Israel under the bus is a huge mistake. If we do not side with Israel and have Israel's back, we have a lot to be afraid of. Not because of what some pol politician thinks. Not because of what you heard on television. Because of what you know God said. God says, these are my people. God says to Israel, I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. I want to mention four movements that have the potential to destroy America as we know it. And somebody may be thinking, you know, when I talk about America going off the cliff, you say, what would happen if America went off the cliff? My prediction is that my grandchildren would be in an underground church. Four movements. Number one, delete God. There's a well-funded, strong, popular movement to delete God and trash Jesus. It's worldwide. In America, it began with the help of a liberal court and has been extremely successful in deleting God from public education and from the public square. Granted, people in both parties have wanted to delete God for a long time because they believe this is a secular nation. And they're trying to make it that way. But they knew they couldn't get by with deleting God. But something changed this year. What happened in Charlotte was huge. You see, since their inception, the political parties have always had God in their platform. They knew they had to. But what happened in Charlotte was that God was removed from the Democratic platform. In 2004, God was mentioned seven times. But now he's left out. There was an uproar. And immediately the president said, put God back in. And so they voted on God. I hope you got to see that. I saw it. I saw it as it was happening. And they voted three times because God kept losing. But the president had said, put God in, and he was already in the teleprompter. So it didn't matter how they voted. They knew they had to put God back in. It was on the teleprompter. But we all heard the loud nays. We heard God boo. The majority didn't want God in. What happened in that room was not, this is not about 
interpretation or spin. We heard it with our own ears. Judgment, listen to me, judgment is sin ripened. Sin coming of age. There are many who believe that we are already under the judgment of God, and that's what's happening in America, is the judgment of God. Read the Bible, and and the Bible is clear of what happens when God begins to judge, when God begins to pour out some of his Wrath. You see, the Bible teaches that, that we can cross a line where God steps in and shakes us like a tent in a tornado. He did that for Israel many times. Romans 1 is an amazing passage where Paul talks about what happens when God says, all right, I'm going to turn you over to your own sins. I mean, you don't want me, you want sin. And you won't believe what I say will be the result of sin. So I'm going to hand you over as judgment To your sins. Verse 18 of Romans 1. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Verse 21. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. Therefore... God, in judgment, gave them over in their sinful desire, in the sinful desires of their hearts, to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the Creator, who is forever praised. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lust. Even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust one for another. Men committed indecent acts with other men and received in themselves a due penalty for their perversion. If we go over the cliff, I will not be able to read this passage in a church. Verse 29. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They're gossip, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They're senseless, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they only continue to do these very things. They not only continue to do these very things, but they approve of those who practice them. They not only continue these awful, awful sins, but they applaud those who do these awful, awful sins. Now here's the sad thing. Paul lists 24 specific sins. And you can go to a a large city and you can find in a newspaper evidence of every one of these 24 sins. Delete God. Number two, downgrade rights and freedoms. Our founding fathers made it, made it crystal clear. You cannot miss it. It's in the Declaration of Independence that our rights come from God, not government. And that our primary duty is to our creator and not the government. Listen to this quote. The same revolutionary beliefs for which our forebears fought are still an issue around the globe. The belief, what the founding fathers believed, the belief that the rights of man come not from the generosity of government, 
but from the hand of God. Who said that? Was it Lincoln? Was it Reagan? It was John Kennedy, a Democrat, in his inaugural address. See how far we've come. Our rights come not from government, but from God. Mr. President, gay marriage is not a civil right. It is a sin. God set up marriage as a divine institution between a man and a woman. The government is not God, and biblical truth does not evolve. I salute 3,700 black pastors who asked the president to retract his statement that gay marriage is a civil right. I'm grateful for those pastors and for their courage. The government has no right, in my opinion, to compel Christian colleges and hospitals to provide health care plans that include paying for abortion services. Abortion is murder. 55 million babies have been ripped from their mother's womb since 1973. A baby's right comes not from government, it comes from God. The government is not God. It's sad that it seems like those who have the least rights, if any rights at all in this country, are the unborn and the born again. You can criticize Muslims and say, and you can't get by with it. You can't offend them in any way or Mohammed in any way. But you can criticize or say anything about the born again group and get by with it. Here's what John Adams said, our second president. It is religion and morality alone which can establish the principles on which our freedom can, secure, can, can securely stand. Thomas Jefferson The liberty, the freedom we claim is from God. Our rights and our freedoms are gifts from God, not a grant from the government. We need to understand that. Our founding fathers understood that. And we need to stand for the rights and freedoms that our brave soldiers have fought and died for and to make sure that freedom continues and those rights continue for our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, and future generations. Let freedom ring. Freedom is a gift from God. And freedom should be used to glorify God. Number one, the movement is to, to delete God. Number two, it is to downgrade rights and freedoms. Because you see, if the government grants rights they can take away any right that they want to take away. And we've already lost rights that we may never get back. Delete God. Downgrade rights and freedoms. Number three, denigrate truth. This is so important. For years, politicians have lied to us, and we have fussed a little and sloughed it off. Both parties. And we often made jokes about it. You know a politician is lying if his lips are moving. But sadly, that's no longer funny. Because now, lying is accepted. I mean, I've heard it several times on television from the, from the media. They simply have no, no problem with somebody just telling you a lie. They have no problem with a politician looking at the American people and telling a lie. Not only that, they applaud those who get by with it. So we are in a situation as a country, we have gone so far away from our founding principles that we no longer can trust the media. We can't trust our government. 
in many ways. And that's what happens when a nation gets away from its roots, its founding principles. You see, truth matters. It matters so much. And we, we've seen the slide. President Richard Nixon lied and tried to cover it up. And people went to prison. I had the privilege to know Chuck Colson, who got saved out of that, one of the greatest Christians. He's now in heaven. And the president left in shame and disgrace because he lied and covered it up. Then Bill Clinton came along and lied. I didn't have sex with that woman. And we slapped his hand. And today he's considered the most popular politician in America. What happened in that time period? And now with what's happened in Libya... What seemed to be lies and apparent cover-up from the terrorist attack that, that killed, murdered four people. Mr. President, tell us the truth. What did you know and when did you know it and what have you done about it? America deserves to know the truth. Listen to me. If we don't demand honesty and integrity and character from America's leadership now, we may miss our only opportunity to save America. If truth doesn't matter to us now, America will not matter later. It's that critical. Truth matters. Andy Andrews, one of my favorite authors, I had the privilege to spend some time with Andy Andrews, a uh, fascinating writer. And uh, he's written a new book that uh, I want every one of you to read. It'd be good for you to read. You read it in 15 minutes. And uh, that's, uh, that's an easy, easy read, but a powerful book. It's entitled How to Kill 11 Million People. And, and, and the whole purpose of the book is, is an understanding of why truth matters more than we think it does. Adolf Hitler killed 11,285,000 people. And he's just one of many countries. You'll read about him in the book where millions have been killed. But how do you kill 11 million people? Lie to them. Lie to them. That's how you do it. And it was, it was lies, not, listen to me, not guards and guns that caused the Jewish men to help their families get into rail cars designed for eight cows and they put a hundred people in each of those rail cars and then padlocked those doors and they were headed to death camps. They only had a handful of guards, only half of them, even had weapons because they didn't need them. Those people got into those cars because they believed a lie. I want to read to you what they were told. The Jews, at last... It can be reported to you that the Russians are advancing on our eastern front. I apologize for the hasty way we brought you into our protection. Unfortunately, it was a little time to explain. You have nothing to worry about. We only want the best for you. You will leave here shortly and be sent to very fine places indeed. You will work there. Your wives will stay at home and your children will go to school. You will have wonderful lives. We all will be terribly crowded on the trains. <laughs> a hundred in a car will hold eight cows. We'll be terribly crowded on the trains, but the journey is short. Men, please keep your families together 
and board the rail cars in an orderly manner. Quickly now, my friends, we must hurry. And those people were being taken to the ovens. And 11,285,000 were murdered because of a lie. Listen to what Hitler said to his inner circle. How fortunate for leaders that men do not think. Make the lie big. Make it simple. And keep saying it. And eventually, they will believe it. Ladies and gentlemen, if you watch television, you know that that philosophy is on the front burner in America. Keep saying the lie over and over and over. Keep it simple. Tell them the wonderful things they're going to do for you. And then repeat it over and over and over. And because men do not think, they will believe it. Truth is critical. Number four. We've said the movement, delete God, downgrade rights and freedoms, denigrate truth. Number four, deny founding principles. During a press conference in Turkey on April 6, 2009, President Barack Obama said, one of the great strengths of the United States is we do not consider ourselves a Christian nation. We consider ourselves a nation of citizens who are bound by ideals and a set of values. Whose ideals? Whose values? And is this true? Two, 2006 ABC poll, 83% of Americans still identify themselves as Christians. 42% say they attend church regularly. We won't check them on that. But they say that. Fortunately, we have the words of our founding fathers that make it clear that the Christian faith was the singular dynamic force that made possible the discovery, the growth, and the foundational principles that made America the greatest country in the world. We have those principles. And for years, they were enforced. The Mayflower Compact is the birth certificate, the first constitution. Pilgrims Creek came to America for the glory of God and for the advancement of the Christian faith to build a Christian nation. And it was a miracle where the Mayflower landed because where they intended to go, they would have met sudden disaster and a tribe of hostile Indians and the weather conditions they would not have survived, could not have survived. But they didn't go the place they intended because a strong wind took over the Mayflower. And they lost control of it. And the Mayflower landed at the only possible place where they could have survived. So God even got them to our shores. And then the first public building was a church and the first public exercise was a worship service and the first schools were Christians and the only textbook was the Bible. They had schools because they wanted children to be able to learn to read the Bible. And the first colleges were Christian colleges. They were to, built to train preachers. 123 of the first 126 colleges were started by churches to train ministers. Harvard's motto, Harvard, Princeton, and Yale all started to train ministers. Harvard's motto, for Christ and his church. For Christ and his church. The first hundred years, all the professors were ministers. The first newspaper was, was a Christian newspaper. The editor of the New York Times was a born-again, Bible-beloving Christian. The first president was a Christian. Spent a couple, of three hours a day in prayer and Bible study. The first Supreme Court justice was a Christian. 
Justice Jay said, we in the province of God have the right to select our rulers, and it's our duty as well as our privilege to prefer and select Christian ones. The Supreme Court in 1796 decided that America is a Christian nation. When it was challenged, they said, we are a Christian nation. In 1885, it was reaffirmed. In 1892, they did this exhaustive study that took, I think, four or five years. They were going to do a completely exhaustive study and make sure, and they did that study, and they said, this is a Christian nation. And then they came back in 1931, and the Supreme Court says, this is indeed emphatically a Christian nation. And how far have we come? Patrick Henry, who said, give me liberty or give me death, said, it cannot be emphasized too strongly that this great nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians. Not on religion, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Those founding principles are being ignored and denied. And that's what made us who we are. We had basically seven principles that we don't have time to talk about now, maybe later, that made us the great nation that we have become, and we have broken every one of those seven principles. We're not what we once were. We're not the nation that we were created to become. We are becoming spiritually and morally bankrupt. So where can we find authentic hope and change? Because we need both. Morals come from theology. Theology comes from the Bible. And the Bible has been entrusted to the church. This is why I'm doing this sermon today in the next two weeks. Because I believe that the church in America is America's last great hope. So let the church rise up. Let the church be the church. Let's stand with uncommon courage. Let's cry out for revival. Let's open up our our hearts and our lives to God and say, God, let revival begin in me as an individual. That's where it starts. And if it does begin in us, we may be the spark that ignites national revival. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Righteousness exalts a nation. Sin is a disgrace to any people. Do not put your trust in princes, in mortal men who cannot save. Put your trust in God. Obey God. Let's pray.